The other thing that I do often is, I should say, not not regularly, but when I was a little kid. Was, Great transition. Keep going. Another thing, that I, another thing that I do often, like I've been naming things that I do often. <laughs> Finally, two brave souls take on the... <laughs> Dig on the acting legacy of O.J. Simpson. <laughs> uh, finally, we're going to get him where it hurts. Timely. His acting skills. Timely. Not his non-murderousness. Welcome to Your Inner Child is an Idiot, the podcast where we look back on things from our childhood and see if they were any good to begin with. My name is DJ. Hi, I'm Damon. Hello, Damon. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so dour. <laughs> We've recorded two episodes, or just intros, not even for two episodes, just intros. The easiest part, I don't even have to do any homework. World weary. I just have to come in and have memories about things. Or not. Jesus Christ, uh, that's you. Again oh, with this. Here we go. <laughs> the Naked Gun is what we're talking about today. Thank the you. The first of three? I know there's at least three. Technically 33 and a third naked gun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Joke that. When they did two and a half was pretty solid. Pretty clever. That was a solid joke. 33 and third was like, well, okay. Less so. Yeah. Yeah. Just cats out of the bag. OJ Simpson is in this movie. And if you know that, like we did, if you didn't grow up seeing this movie, mm-hmm. I imagine that would be jarring for you to be like, <laughs> this just OJ Simpson in this movie. The funny thing for me is that during the OJ Simpson trial, I have no interest in football. So all I thought of was that guy from Naked Gun. It's Nordberg. Poor poor Nordberg. Do you have any memories of this movie? Have you seen this movie before? I've seen this movie. I loved this as a kid. Is it this one or the second one where he says, that'd be me. I've been swimming in raw sewage. (laughs) I love it. I'm going to pretend I don't know exactly what movie it's in and when it happens in the movie. And I'm going to pretend I'm being kind of cagey about it and say, I think it's in the second one. It's in the I second think one. I, I'd have to go back to the tape. We'll have to see after we watch this one. If it's not in this one, we'll have to assume it's in the second one. But I feel like dollars to donuts that it's in the second one. Here's what I remember about this one. Priscilla Presley looking yep. fine. Mm-hmm. I remember... O.J. Simpson's character, Norbert, getting beat up a lot. That's like his shtick. I mean, in all of them, he's sort of the wily yeah. coyote, which is almost, I mean, they wouldn't have known ahead of time, but it almost keeps him like in a method yeah. where I'm like, this is fine. I'll watch this domestic abuser yeah. and alleged murderer have the shit beaten out of him thoroughly throughout a movie. That's is he, fine. Is he even alleged? Name? He's acquitted, right? He was acquitted. So, Except I mean- he Civil was he trial. was accused and arrested for it, but acquitted by a jury of his peers, you know, and then later found civilly responsible for her right. death. A lot um, lower bar. After the fact, went to the life. went to jail for you know trying to steal some memorabilia that he had signed ages ago. A sidebar: legal terms. Should we <laughs> Good cover one. the O.J. Simpson uh, yes, exhibit trial? Exhibit B, uh, Your Honor. I feel like we should cover the O.J. Simpson trial. You as want us to episode. cover the trial? What does as that an mean to you? As an episode, just no, like talk I know, about but it. What are we going to watch? The trial? Footage? I don't know. <laughs> That's a little too inside baseball. We can get out of there. I'd like to adjourn legal <laughs> and we'll convene sort of semi In my chambers. In the chambers mm-hmm. at a later date here to forthwith mm-hmm. to be determined. Maybe we can bring in uh, his honor, the mayor, our legal expert to talk about Oh, yeah, of course. I also remember like the main thing that happens is like the main conflict is Reggie Jackson and like (laughs) umpires or somebody are brainwashed in order to kill the queen. Yeah. The queen of England (laughs) is the target. The target. The mark. Yeah. To use hitman terms. Did you watch Police Squad? So this is based on Police Squad, a TV show. A 1970s busy show yeah. that I believe aired six episodes before being canceled, which oh, I okay. have seen all six episodes, I want to say, because I think Comedy Central in its way early days was like, okay, yeah. oh, we can get this for 20 bucks and a song. Yeah. yeah, we'll play the six episodes of Police Squad. It's a ludicrous show. I mean, in the same way that this is ludicrous. Yeah. Although I want to say Police Squad, the show, every episode, much like a lot of 70s and 80s show, ends with everyone sort of laughing and then freeze framing. 
but then it's not a literal freeze frame. They're just <laughs> frozen in time. So it's usually someone's pouring another person a cup of coffee yeah. <laughs> and it just keeps pouring out of their cup, pouring out of the urn. It's deranged. I, it makes I me laugh. That. It I makes me laugh. This is your shit, right? <laughs> this is. I feel like this is your exactly your brand of humor, and I'm not saying that in that any before sort of denigrating way. I want you to define my brand of humor before we move forward. I don't know if I can in a. I can only use things right. Hudson Hawk. Yeah, that's one of my humors. This the combination of Hudson Hawk, Naked Gun, Seinfeld, and The Simpsons, and. Yeah. I feel like there's one more thing, but I can't place it. 30 Rock. The answer was- 30 Rock. Sure. 30 Rock. <laughs> I feel like 30 Rock and The Simpsons, while not exactly the same, no, are the same No, you're right. Actually, I would put lane. them- The Simpsons is the grandfather to- yeah. It's the parent of Arrested Development and then the grandfather to 30 Rock. That's the family tree the lineage. Of there. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, in the Austin Powers mold where I sort of talked about, I like it when smart people tell stupid jokes. I feel like this right. is in that vein of, you can tell that the person who wrote this joke is smart, but the joke is still dumb. It's and I appreciate stupid. it all the more because of that. <laughs> yes. I mean, I like it when there's not a lot of mugging to the camera and like uh, Leslie Nielsen, I think sort of what you're doing right now raises the bile in my throat. What if I sing a song to you and you <laughs> never break eye contact with the camera? No, anti, anti bros act three. No, oh I don't God. want it. We'll talk about that off mic. Yeah, I really remember my brother going to see this in the theaters. And I remember I, you might be surprised to find out, I was scandalized by the fact <gasps> that Naked was in the title. Oh. <laughs> I was a young child. I remember this movie taught me what the word beaver meant because there is a beaver mm. joke in this. Yeah. And I had to turn to my brother and go, what does that mean? And he said, that's a nickname for, a, a, to my brother's credit, he was like, that's a nickname for a woman's vagina, like over it, just <laughs> here you go. And I'm like, oh, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Rather than like Phyllis and Harry being like, we'll tell you KG in about five it. years, yeah. I guess. And I'm like, oh, what does it all mean? It was already not in use anymore, really. But yeah, it's a very, it's a very weird. I'm like, I'm trying to even think of like how would you use it in context in an earnest way. Like it just seems yeah. like a weird thing to just. It's uh, you know, you've got that that hard R at the end, and then you know the V. That seems weird. That doesn't seem like a sexy word. It just seems like a clinical word, even though it's like an animal euphemism. It's deranged. Why would you ever being use from, that for that? Being from Beaver Creek, we were the Beaver Creek oh. battling beavers. No, that's not and good. the uh, the young like football would be eager beaver. Oh, footballs. come on! And it was like footballs. I said <laughs> footballs. You had the footballs over here. And footballs. Even by the time like we n knew the joke and we're already like over it. Well, no one calls it that anymore. So whoever came up with this, it was like before they started using it, and then it got real funny for a while, and then eventually people got over it because they don't call. Vaginas, beavers. I was going to cite my oft cited joke, which is that every company that's naming something should have a 15 year old boy on its yeah. board of directors. But in this case, they did. They were a yeah. high school football team. There should have, the minute they heard a stifled laugh, they're like, we can't name it the what e is, No, Greg, I know you're already painting the sign. Don't put eager beavers. We're going to have to, we're going to have to go back to committee on this. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't any good. Can Call we rename the town? Beavers. Do we have that power? No? Okay. <laughs> no? We're still going to have to come up with a different animal. I like this also because it is in the vein of like 70s cop shows, yeah. murder mysteries. You have real sweet spot of like B-list, C-list actors. You got the Leslie Nielsens. You got the George Kennedys. You got the Ricardo Montalbans. Priscilla Presley, I mean, she seems like a real nice lady. She's been through a lot this year. Also wasn't at her like career peak when I think right. she like accepted the role in this. This is the only thing I knew her from. And I was like, it actually was much later that I realized that like her last name was Presley because she was married to El like I didn't even know who she was. I remember my brother telling me this when we watched it and I remember being like how does the math on that work out? Part of it was that I could not place like Elvis Presley was someone who died when I before I was born. Yeah. being associated in any way especially like the same generation as someone now. But then I realized, oh, actually, technically, they are not the same generation. She was like 14. It's yeah. fine. It's, it's fine. fine. Your Don't heroes are all monsters. Never look up to anyone. It's not bad advice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly don't put them on pedestals. Believe in yourself. <laughs>
Yeah, there's clips that have been going around somewhat recently that I've come across of Leslie Nielsen on talk shows using a fart machine. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually had this served to me as well for mysterious reasons. I don't know why would they would think that was in my humor wheelhouse, but I saw him, I think on Letterman, doing a little fart, like telling a story and farting in the breaks of his serious story. Not everyone could pull it off, but it's <laughs> humorous and... I have nothing to say. It farts, farts can be funny. I think what's also funny to me is, that, and I think this is lost even on our generation and certainly on generations after us, that he was a serious actor. Right. Yeah. And the fact that he was doing this sort of deadpan comedy was a break from his career. And so now sometimes when me, me and Tyler are watching Murder, She Wrote as our wine town show, and he like pops up in that, and I keep waiting for him to like, fall on his ass and i'm like no he's just playing the captain of a ship for some reason i'm supposed to sit here and pretend that's just a normal guy (laughs) being the captain of a ship now of course i didn't just say that i also belabored the point by telling tyler that i think the fact that he's the captain of a ship is also a reference to the fact that he was the captain of the poseidon in the 70s disaster classic the poseidon adventure Mm -hmm. and tyler's already asleep at that point so (laughs) you didn't even make it through the sentence (laughs) He Did doesn't say- usually snore, but he's really doing a big job of it now. It's almost like he's doing it for show, like to tell me something. But I'm going to keep telling him about Leslie Nielsen's pre-Naked Gun career. <laughs> Did you say your Wine Town show? Our Wind Down show. Oh, really? Okay. That makes much more sense. I was like, I Come kinda, on down kinda- to Wine Town. We're watching Murder, She Wrote. It contextually had the same kind of- <laughs> No, it's the same that's, vibe, but it's- It's Wine Town, baby. <laughs> different. It's 9 p.m. You know you know where we're going? Oh, wine Town. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, typically our Wine Town shows, or Wine Town shows, are shows we've seen already. But right. with Murder, She Wrote, it's so ephemeral. It's so cotton candy that it's like, who cares if we've seen it or not? Right. I'm going to play, you know, my phone apps and Tyler's going to straight up go to sleep. And eventually I'll be like, oh, yeah, I was... Of course, it was the the heiress to the romance novelist fortune that, of course, killed her father. <laughs> and then they're like, and I would have gotten away with it, ah, too, if it weren't for you, Jessica for you Fletcher. meddling old woman. <laughs> Who's seen a lot of death. A lot seen of a death. lot of death, and she seems to be not put out by it, because also, Murder, She Wrote ends on those free frame laugh things every time. <laughs> I'm like, someone's dead. Someone knew, usually, typically, someone Jessica Fletcher knew. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, we're halfway through season two, so she's seen 36 deaths. People she's known been not just like dying of random causes, but These people all in the been same town? Actively mur- No, luckily, at first I thought, oh, wow, Cabot Cove, Maine is just Lousy terrible. With death. Don't go there. There are some streets in Cabot Cove you just don't go down, DJ. But actually, she travels a lot. She goes to New York City a lot. She runs into Jerry Orbach, who is a private investigator. Oh, I thought he was going to be in the Catskills. Like for- <laughs> no, he's, he's a private investigator in New York that she runs into a lot when she's in that town. She goes to a lot of murder or mystery conventions. She went to New Orleans once. It wasn't problematic because of the black community in the area, the jazz community that she was visiting with. It wasn't problematic at all. It was handled with skill and aplomb, I would have to say. Cool. Well done, Jess. Yeah, no She's problem there. done it again. We're going to watch Naked Gun. Watch <laughs> along with us. <laughs> we'll be right back. We just talked about murder she wrote for so long. It's important to this story. Closer to my mic. It's never bothered you to this point. Well, I don't usually have it so far away. I usually don't have my. All of a sudden, Damon's concerned about mic technique. (laughs) (laughs) Are you? Do you want me in the same room as the mic, or is that just an ambient noise thing? Are you like an NPR producer just trying to get the feel of the coffee shop I'm in? We're like eight years in, and all of a sudden, you're like, "Do I need to choke up on the mic?" Or okay. No bad ideas. Spitball me ideas on how we can, we need to promote our Patreon page to the, the listeners. We are a newlywed couple in a okay. pet shop. Okay. Yes, and? And the owner. I like that. I just say yes, and, and you have to do the and. <laughs> and the owner 
wants us to join a multi-level marketing scheme. Okay, okay. And we're the couple, and then we're going to have to bring in a third person to be the owner, because I sort of overcast this right out of the gate. We can't be a, a newlywed couple in an empty pet shop. Just for background. That's not a yes and. Just for background here. Is this a cult? Like, is this actually a cult, or is it like a normal, less cult A multi-level culty? marketing scheme isn't a cult. It's a way of making money in your free time. I mean... I've now cast myself as the owner of the Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, how does that tie in to people going to patreon.com slash your inner an idiot and supporting the show? All right, so... First level. What you want to do is you want to buy as many episodes of your inner child as an idiot as you can possibly fit in your garage. <laughs> then you tell five friends about your inner child as an yeah. idiot. Get them to pay your... Pay, uh, your they Patreon. pay for the yeah. episodes you've already purchased. <laughs> yeah. You buy more episodes from us. Yeah. Then they're telling five friends. They're purchasing episodes back from you to resell to their friends. Mm -hmm. It creates this um, three-dimensional triangle shape of yes. mm -hmm. you at the top. Yeah. Five friends, five friends, five friends. It's a tetrahedron scheme. Yeah. yeah. And by the 13th level of friends, you've gotten every person on the globe to mm -hmm. buy episodes of your neural child is an idiot yeah there is a catch though uh -oh. and we haven't really honed this out yet okay. all episodes are currently free so okay that's something that's, we're working at head office we're trying to, to figure that to out rectify because it's hard to like exchange zero dollars to other people right your five friends are giving you zero dollars for all <laughs> the episodes it's this whole thing but we're gonna work it out it's part of our growth but go to your inner child is an idiot what is the URL? Hold on. It's your in a child is an idiot dot com. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a 301 redirect when you get there. Don't worry about it. It's not stealing any of your data. As far as we know. Check it out. Perfect. <laughs> Editor, see if you can make that 30 seconds instead of three minutes. Thanks. <laughs> we are back. We watched the naked gun from the fly. Wait. Is it from the flies? I, well, I interrupted myself and I was already going to screw it up. Is it the naked gun or just naked? It's naked gun. I think it's the naked gun colon from, from the, the files of police squad okay. exclamation point. Okay. I'm going to need you to recap this movie. That's great because as our audience knows, I just watched it recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's been no time. There's no nope. gap of time between when I watched it. And this point, we haven't had any technical issues. There hasn't been a episode. huge problem recording episodes, and we definitely haven't tried this three or four times at this point. So don't worry With about it. a week it. in between each attempt. <laughs> it's great. It's working out. Don't worry. Prepare yourself for the best recap of a movie <laughs> you've ever heard in your life. Frank Drebin. <laughs> we don't open on Officer Norberg, but uh, near the beginning of the movie, Officer Norberg gets shot while trying to infiltrate a drug smuggling scheme. He's the partner of Frank Drebin, our hero, who then takes it upon himself to solve the case of what was going on with Norberg. Norberg is essentially incapacitated at this point. Mm -hmm. But here's a twist. The queen, Queen Elizabeth, RIP, is coming to Los Angeles for a ceremonial Three trip. Times. Gonna see a baseball game, go to a state dinner, the whole gig. And police squad, the squad within the police, self-explanatory, is uh, assigned to protect her, do security. So Frank has to sort of lead up that protection for the queen while also trying to solve Nordberg's case. Ugh, the hijinks that ensue, mm -hmm. TJ. And eventually he gets kicked off of police squad because of some questionable choices in solving Nordberg's case, and kind of accidentally burns down the luxury apartment of Ricardo Montalban, who may not only be ahead of this drug smuggling ring, he might also be in some sort of scheme to assassinate Queen Elizabeth II, not the first. There's two of them in history, so I don't <laughs> want you to conflate the two Thank you together. Thank you for the clarification. The Spanish Armada tried to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I. In this uh, okay. one, it's Ricardo Mont. It's character actor Ricardo Montalban, and he's part of the Spanish Armada. I'm not following. No, no, no. no. You're losing it. You're losing the okay. thread okay. here entirely. Okay. Sit down. You're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> anyway, you know what? Frank solves the case and falls in love with Elvis Presley's ex-wife. It's all great and yeah. defeats Ricardo Montalban by throwing him off the balcony at a Los Angeles or California Angels game, where he's crushed by a marching band singing "Louie Louie." Yeah. Details were missed. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's the the gist of it. I got I to gotta say, that went 
much better than last time. So Whew, I'm glad our recording was not working last time we recorded <laughs> because that was that one was terrible. If you thought this was a piece of shit, that one was really terrible. Do you want to start with the sort of cartoonish Middle Eastern setup? Frank begins the movie in <laughs> Beirut on he's he's vacationing in Beirut and ends, Shh, don't laugh and ends up on a spy mission of sorts. It's absolutely ludicrous, barely ties into the main plot. The only reason we it might have anything to do with the main plot is that Mr. Pap Schmier is seen at the table with all these global ne'er-do-wells of the late 80s, and we see him later giving the assignment to Ricardo bon- Montalban to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. Why kill the ceremonial figurehead of, of England? I don't know. But that's their scheme, and they're sticking to it. Yeah, we see there's a lot of uh, the heavy hitters of the late 80s, early 90s. You got Muammar Gaddafi, mm-hmm. Mikhail Gorbachev, yep. Idi Amin, yep. Ayatollah Khomeini. Mm-hmm. Some just standard out of the box goons, which I appreciated, just like just wearing a Beach Boy cap, tweed jacket, straight out of like the Batman 60s TV show. I was trying to think if I should be offended by this. I think because it's specific heads of state, I wasn't really particularly bothered by it. I mean, I mean, you could say there's a sort of just like a a pushing of global politics of the 1980s, but it's very. Do you want me to pour one out for Idi Amin? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's so cartoonish that it's hard to get too upset about it. I'm sure if I were a dictator in the 80s, I might be upset about it. But (laughs) (laughs) we've all moonlit as dictators. (laughs) It was got to pay the bills. One of them says, "What Idi Amin?" Or who says it? We we, they're upset with America because they're they're not being. They want to be part of the peace process, which if you think about it too much, you're like, well, that doesn't seem so bad. But he says, we must rip their entrails out and drag them from here to Damascus until they include us in the peace process. <laughs> that was a pseudo Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat yes. yeah. and we've also got, I mean, a joke. The only joke that I got from this whole thing when I was a kid, which was Frank puts Gorbachev in a, head, in a headlock and rubs his birthmark off and says, I knew it to the camera. <laughs> so stupid. It's so stupid, it, but it's very, it's Bugs Bunny-esque, you know, like yeah. it's not. And uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini has a mohawk when, when he knocks off his head right. covering, he has a bright orange. Like, That's not great. Mohawk. Culturally. I guess, but, I guess so. it's so stupid. But it's though. so stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Then we kick into probably my favorite part, which is the theme song. The opening credits. The opening uh, credits. Yeah, and the theme song. The theme song is from the original. Since our first re- attempted record, uh, recording and this one, I have confirmed that it is the uh, theme song to the original Ira Newborn. Uh, show. Ira Newborn. I just know that from the credits. I don't know anything about that oh. person, but it's a, it's a jam. It is a good, it's a very brassy, fun, kind of funky thing that play. I mean, this, this whole thing is a pastiche of... There it is. It's there. Coming. Oh, it's thank coming. God. The third host of this podcast, Damon saying pastiche too much. <laughs> I was worried we were going to go an episode without saying it, but here we are. And I mean, the, the, the soundtrack in general, but especially this opening number is very much in that style of Kojak and Starsky and Hutch and those, those type of 70s cop shows. Beretta, I think that was a, technically a detective show, not cop show but you get the idea are detective shows not cop shows i put them in the same bucket well sometimes they're just you know casual detectives trying to solve a case and sometimes they're actually in the police force i mean i feel like wannabe cops are cops as far as jessica fletcher she ain't no cop she's a cop (laughs) but yeah the opening credits are pretty great they're all filmed from atop a police car yeah. As it drives through little... streets and then eventually on a roller coaster track, through a house, through a person's home, through a girl's locker room, boobs, through a car wash. It's pretty magnificent. It's pretty great. And ends at a donut shop. Gotcha, cops. Yeah. You'll think twice before you, you know, trample our civil rights again. This <laughs> that's this is the first moment I had in this ever watching one of these movies or in in this watching going like Oh, yeah. Is there a mild anti-cop sentiment in this? Like, obviously, it's a spoof. And so our hero is a fucking idiot. (laughs) Yes. There's ineptitude abound. But it's mostly the cops. 
they solve the case in spite of themselves yeah, in the end, yeah. rather than anything else. Which fairly true to life. <laughs> but I never that was the first time I thought of it when they go up to the donut shop and I, I kind of got to thinking about like, you know, the whole trope of cops and donuts and and then the whole movie. I was I had that in the back of my mind and I hadn't really ever dawned on me before on previous watchings. I don't think it's like a hard a cab agenda or anything like that so much as <laughs> it's like, not a conscious one i would say yeah but there is a kind a lot of the jokes hit differently in 2023 than they probably would have in 1989 yeah. where it just felt like a a flippant example of a cop too prone to pulling out his gun whereas now it feels a lot different yeah but i will say you know a lot of the movies we watch deal with sometimes age poorly and this aged almost like a fine wine in that it got <laughs> more like trenchant as time passed. Yeah. And, you know, there are a lot of off jokes that, you know, make me laugh in a lot different way in 2023. At one point, Frank Drebin gets kicked off of the police squad. As I said, my magnificent recap. And he <laughs> says, just imagine the next time I shoot somebody, I could be I could arrested. Be arrested. <laughs> uh, that same that same scene, he's cleaning out his desk. <laughs> he says, look at that, <laughs> the missing evidence in the Kellner case. He was innocent. And then I forget his name, the other guy. George Kennedy's character. Yeah. I can't, it slips by me. He says, he went well. to the chair two years ago, Frank. Which is <laughs> <laughs> pretty great. Very funny. And then he just shoves it back in the file. No thought about it whatsoever. Well, and, and they tell the story of like Frank <laughs> saw like Shakespeare in the, in the park <laughs> and he murdered, <laughs> he murdered five actors. Good ones. <laughs> That may be one of my, I mean, there's very rare, rare reason for me to mutter with my teeth clenched. That was a Shakespeare in the Park production of Julius Caesar, you moron. But the way that woman reads it, I can't remember her name now either. Hold on. I actually want to get it. Is that I'm the mayor? Frustrated. The yeah. mayor of Los Angeles in the movie. She's probably most famous to our generation. She played the mother in The Sopranos and then famously yeah. died during The Sopranos and they oh. had to CGI her. In the 2000s, back into oh, no. a scene before they had wrapped up her character's storyline. I missed that. AKA life. Ooh, apparently it's terrible. But let me pull it up because I want to have these actors' names and characters if I can. Nancy Marchant it plays the mayor. Shakespeare in the Park production of Julius Caesar <laughs> Moore. Sorry, I'm just going to have that in my head. Please. Really, the best thing that the cops do, aside from accidentally solving the cases, is that I guess they're cops, but they're coming to arrest Frank because he's he's <laughs> trying to stop the assassination and he poses as an umpire later. We're jumping ahead a little bit here. But the, he's – or no, he's he's not an umpire yet. He's posing as Enrico Palazzo, the opera singer who's singing the national anthem. So he's faking his way through the national anthem, which is excellent. <laughs> Lots of bombs in the air. I really like that. <laughs> the cops don't know what to do because they, they're running on the field and then they're like holding their hearts, but then they're like sidling – Towards sidling closer and closer, yeah. That was the best thing that the cops do in the entire movie. It's great. What is his? What does he do the, for the final two lines of the Star Spangled Banner? Or the free of the land and the land of the free? Yeah. Which makes me laugh. <laughs> it's a well-drawn well, Damon, of people fucking up the Star they Spangled no. Banner. <laughs> that And when it hits, it hits. And that one works for me. I don't know. Because he's an absolutely atrocious singer and doesn't know the words. He's supposed to be an opera singer. He's doing like this Bugs Bunny scheme during the whole last act where he's just like dressing up as different people in order to get on the field because he's been barred he's from, check every from player. participating. Yeah. So, because so he initially dresses up as this opera singer, knocks him unconscious, ties him up, standard Indiana Jones schemes, and then the next time he poses as an umpire. Pretty great. Pretty funny. You know, we talked about this in the intro, but let's just, let's just address the OJ of it all. OJ Simpson is in this movie. He's not very much in this movie, which I was grateful for because I was, you know, I haven't seen it since... The murder, the double homicide, that alleged no. double homicide. I mean, it end. happened, but. No, uh, it did. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That we can confirm. You know, I was fine with all that, but the robbing of paraphernalia of his own memorabilia, that's where I draw that's, the line. Yeah. We, the rules are rules, Mr. Simpson. You're going to jail for that. <laughs> yeah, he's not in this movie. And I will say, I mean, he's mostly comatose throughout this movie, on top of which he is consistently being humiliated. He gets the shit beat out of him at every turn. He, uh, yeah, gets a vase thrown at his head. He gets sandwiched between his hospital bed, folds in half at one point. 
uh, inwards so that he's sandwiched in between it. That's pretty funny when you believe that he might be a murderer and a wife abuser. So that kind of like the cop thing, it ages in a different way where you're like, yeah, fuck him up. <laughs> uh, yeah, knock him down the the while he's in a wheelchair, knock him down the steps of a giant baseball stadium bleachers and knock him into the field. Sure. Like, great. It, I wouldn't say that I want to see him step in a bear trap, but of people that I could see step in a bear trap, he's high on the list, I guess. You know what I mean? He's like, in the top 50. Of like tolerable. Anyway. <laughs> So when Frank comes home, I just want to talk about this scene real quick. When <laughs> Frank comes home from his vacation in Beirut, which he makes sure to say. <laughs> Weird Al is also apparently on the flight from Beirut. <laughs> Could have been a connecting flight, I guess. And so there's lots of people like waiting. They like bring flowers and he says, no flowers, thank you. And there's like a podium and there's like a, a throng of people waiting and they're clearly waiting for Weird Al, but he thinks it's for him. Massive press waiting for Weird Al to get off of a plane. Yeah, also funny. <laughs> Even in the late 80s, I don't know if this was happening, but no, absolutely not. <laughs> but uh, th I think that was the, an intended joke, of course. Like they, they made it a celebrity that would in itself be funny. And mm -hmm. then Frank gives a little speech. <laughs> 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 it's very good. No flowers. Thank you. I I'm going to, uh, you know, that's a dad joke. You know, if someone is just carrying flowers. <laughs> absolutely. Just, yeah. yeah. I will say one of the things I really like in an overall way, one of the things I appreciate about this movie is that there doesn't seem to be any type of joke that is off limits. A dad joke like no flowers, please. A celebrity cameo from a C-string celebrity like Weird Al Yankovic. I say that with the utmost love. Right. But I feel like they go for a smorgasbord of types of jokes where it'll be a joke about you know, C string celebrities. It'll be a dad joke like no flowers, please. It'll be a dirty joke. It'll be a joke where they're in full size giant body condoms when they're having sex. Excellent. I didn't Prop get that. Prop jokes where he like pulls his collar yeah. and his entire suit comes off. Even like li weird camera tricks where he will walk in front of a set instead of in the doorway yes. of a set. Little jokes like that, which are, it just goes to show like, like there is nothing off limits. Yeah. It really felt like, I think Mel Brooks pioneered this also in the 70s and it feels like this is sort of carrying that torch of course airplane before this also by the zuckers but this seems to be forwarding that that sort of anything goes yeah and mentality. it's the like mileage or the jokes per minute are really intense especially I, I do think it lulls a little bit in the second act but like the first and third act they're just common and like if you don't like one it doesn't matter because there's one coming in less than 30 seconds there's something else and I really enjoyed the the volume of it because like they don't all they're mostly stupid, but it's stupid in a way that makes you go like it's, you're still laughing while saying it's stupid. You know, you're yeah. like, it's, you got me like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it reminded me a lot of Mystery Science Theater. I mean, they're very different programs, of course, but Mystery Science Theater also has that mentality of like, we're just here just to throw make it out. Whatever joke you have, uh, we'll do it, whether it makes any sense or not, whether it's referencing something obscure or something just like a joke you've heard 600 times or a pun, dear God, they'll do it. They're going for I, like I really appreciate volume so that, you know, if, if, they, yeah. if they land a batting average of 300 is pretty good. And, but you got to consider that's <laughs> only three out of every 10 jokes. But yeah, the, and I think, I don't know, most of them it, at least land in the sense that it's not like you don't get it. You know what I mean? If and, and uh, if it's stupid, it's still stupid in a way that makes you uh, chuckle a little bit. Usually, there's a pee joke. He is giving. <laughs> he's at like a speech with the mayor or like a press conference, and then he goes away and ends up. They didn't mute his mic, which is really on the sound guy, not on Frank. But he has this very long. It's like the Austin Powers joke of he has this really long pee. And my favorite part of it is not only uh, okay, he just go, it goes on and on, and the guy's still not turning off the mic for some reason. <laughs> just keep it going. And they did have to like swap mics, so he probably just had the he didn't know which one it was or something. But don't feel like you need to figure out what what the sound guy fucked up. It doesn't matter <laughs> for this pee joke. But they it, also my favorite thing is he goes. Whoops. Uh-oh. <laughs> he yes. also stops at one point for a considerable amount of time, so you think it's finally over, only for him to recommence micturating. But whoops, uh-oh, is definitely something I'm going to start saying <laughs> in public urinals. Uh-oh. Oh, man. I mean, a great dumb joke that I really enjoyed is uh, when they're – well, actually, two, because one just sprung to mind. When they come to check out where Nordberg – was shot, which was on a ship and he fell into, there is a chalk outline 
on the ocean, yeah. which is a great little visual gag. And then he goes to check out what was happening with a guy who was working the pier at that time. He's like, hey, can you tell me what happened here last night? And the guy's like, I don't know. My memory's kind of hazy. And he's like, maybe this will help your memory. And he gives him a $20 bill. And he's like, I don't know. It's still kind of fuzzy. And he gives him another $20 bill. And he's like, yeah, I know what was happening. And he starts telling him. And he's like, he, he claims that Nordberg was a dirty cop. And Frank Drebin's like, hey, I, I don't want you to, he like sort of rough grabs him by the collar and is roughing him up. And he's like, well, what are you investigating all this for? And Frank Drebin's like, well, I really can't. I really can't tell you that. And the guy, then the informant is now giving him $20 to get more information. Uh, and then at one point, it's they so do it for a third round. And and Frank Drebin says, can you spot me a 20? And the guy gives him a 20 that he just received to give to Frank that gives it to him. It's a funny joke. And probably, I imagine to our listeners, even funnier. Yeah. Sort of half recollected now. That one is probably best in this scenario where you're just, telling what happened it's one of those gags yeah. where if you just are sort of given bare <laughs> sketches of two figures not really given a background and the person recounting it is just sort of half remembering the lines <laughs> it's really that's the way to enjoy it podcasting also ricardo montalban offers him a cigar and says cuban he says no <laughs> dutch irish my father was from wales two jokes <laughs> In the same so stupid. vintage. Is it the church or something is, or the hospital? Something is called Our Lady of Worthless Miracle, which I really enjoyed. That was the, the hospital that Nordberg yeah. uh, is staying in. Although in a later scene, it is also just the hospital, the hospital in big text on the building. Deranged. So we also meet Priscilla Presley's character, Jane. This is where I did not know who Priscilla Presley was before this and my youth. I knew, I remember my brother telling me that that was Elvis Presley's wife. And my brain kind of broke a little bit because in my brain, you might as well say Elvis knew Cleopatra. Yeah. He's from a completely different era, even though he died five years before I was born. To me, he's like ancient history. So yeah. the fact that someone is here, not only knew him, but was married to him, I could not comprehend it. Not to mention, she's still young. There's a reason for that in this movie. Is also like, I'm like, wait, how did she know the guy that I know from all those black and white videos that they show on 60 Minutes that I watch with my family, like like every eight year old day? <laughs> Like kids do. So it broke my brain a little bit yeah, that, same. that she was somehow, not even Elvis Presley's daughter, Elvis Presley's wife. Yeah. It never, she was 14 when they met. Don't worry about that. Just wanted to get that out there. She was 14 when they met. I think she holds her own in this movie. It's, she doesn't have as many <laughs> laugh lines as anybody else, but she has several. And my favorite is, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to get my rest tonight. Tomorrow being Arbor Day and all. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm going to try to use in regular conversation. She also has one of the jokes that I did not get. I didn't get it as a child. And now watching it again, I didn't get it. And that is, mm -hmm. he says, he looks at her ankle and says, I love the ankle bracelet. And she says, how did that get down there? <laughs> and I always thought, was that supposed to go in her vagine? Is that what we're saying? I don't, like, it sounded like it was supposed to be a dirty joke. I don't understand. <laughs> to me, I think it's just a dumb joke. Like, Tyler was also asking about that because yeah. he was sort of thrown off by it. But even as a kid, like, I took it as, it is a, it was supposed to be around her wrist and somehow it got down okay. to her ankle. That's it's nonsense. That's probably right. I guess it was like, not that I'm so smart because I liked all the other dumb jokes, but I guess it was like too <laughs> simple that I didn't even make that connection. Or maybe it's not the greatest joke. <laughs> or maybe the beaver joke right before it was still lodged in your brain. Yeah, because she has a stuffed beaver. He says, nice beaver. She has beaver. a literal stuffed beaver. He says, nice beaver. And she says, I just got it stuffed. And then into frame comes a literal a taxidermy beaver. Now, the thing that I do often is, I should say, not not regularly, but when I was a little kid. <laughs> Great was, transition. Keep going. <laughs> another, thing that I, another thing that I do often, like I've been naming <laughs> things that I do often. <laughs> When he's in the hospital, uh, Norberg's in a hospital, <laughs> he goes to see him and there's someone trying to, has been brain, the doctor has been brainwashed to try to assassinate Norberg and he's smothering him with a pillow and Frank walks in and then he just throws the pillow and Frank gets like, grabs it and is like smothering himself with it. Yeah, he holds it to his face as if someone else were pressing it on him, but it's just him. Really enjoyed that. I believe that is a joke that was in the original show. 
Mm. You know, he came upon some goons like breaking into a woman's apartment, does the same thing. Still works. Still it's works. A good bit. I do want to sort of address the Priscilla Presley thing because oh, yeah. I, I think Please it, Leslie, that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Nielsen gets a lot of credit and rightfully for, you know, being this sort of straight actor who you know, is able to deliver these ridiculous lines with a straight face. But I think to the Zucker's credit, almost everyone in this movie is a fairly serious actor, at least character actor, who's not known for comedies. And every yeah. one of them do very well. I mean, George Kennedy was like a popular character actor in the 60s and 70s, was in things like Death on the Nile and Earthquake. And he's not like a particularly comedic actor. O.J. Simpson, known for footballing at the time, Priscilla Presley being the child bride of the king of rock and roll. It's a, like a huge roster of people. I don't think there's any particularly comedian or comedy actor in this. Ricardo Montalban also. Weird Al. Just sort of weird Al, but I mean, he he doesn't even have a line. He waves <laughs> from a plain door. <laughs> so I feel like yeah. that yeah, is probably point. the strength. I think of the Zuckers in general, when you think of Airplane is sort of the same way, as opposed to, I referenced Mel Brooks earlier. Mel Brooks did like ex- essentially just work with comedic actors like Madeline Kahn, Gregory Hines, and Dom DeLuise. But then this, while taking the same type of humor, plays it as straight as possible while doing the most ridiculous stuff. It really works, even yeah. though it doesn't feel like it should. It all really works. It would be weird if they were acting any more skillfully. You know what I mean? Like, not that they're doing a, a bad job or anything, but it's it's like... It's, Do you mean if they were being more comedic with their yeah, acting style? It would be weird. And it's like, you can't really judge. You can't say like, well, I, I, I still don't really know if I know if Priscilla Presley is a good actress or not from this. I think she did a great <laughs> job in this, uh-huh. but I don't feel like this is an easy way to judge. You don't remember from that episode of Touched by an Angel? I do not. <laughs> Let me select from my DVD collection. Anyway. <laughs> which episode, which season was it? That would be season five, of course, yeah. as we all know. Hold on. I did not get the condom joke as a child. I just want to. Absolutely not. Had no idea. I was like, what is, I, what is that? I had to turn to, <laughs> what is this? Yeah. And Jason's like, I don't, I'm not going to get involved. I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Can we talk about my favorite scene? And it's so ludicrous. It's actually shortly after the the scene where he sees the doctor has been brainwashed. This is also my favorite scene. It leads to a car chase. Yeah, okay. (laughs) It leads to a car chase where uh, Frank has to commandeer a car. And this is such a perfect idea because I'm surprised it's never been used in any sort of cop media before. Because he commandeers a car, gets in, and it's an old man on the passenger side and a young woman in the driver's seat. And the old man starts saying, now, Stephanie, check your mirror. It's John Houseman. Turn the key. Turn, yeah. Yeah. Shakespearean actor Sir John Hausman, for some reason, is playing the driver's ad instructor, and he, Frank turns to see that he's in a student driving automobile. And it's things. Why did I say it like that? What is wrong with me? He's in a driver's ed car, is what I meant to say. And a student's instructionable. <laughs> it's a ground dirigible. Uh, I don't know. It's a ludicrous scene. Of course, Stephanie is uh, nervous and she keeps haltingly braking. The car keeps like jerking forward while they're supposed to be chasing. They accidentally turn down a one way street. So, John Hausman, in his, I mean, this is maybe close to his last role. I think he yeah. died shortly after this. He says, Now, normally you wouldn't be driving 65 miles per hour <laughs> down a one way street. Of course, then uh, there's a semi barreling down upon them, and uh, John Hausman instructs her to hit the brakes, go into reverse. <laughs> and uh, she's like gunning like, it by this point. <laughs> right. The truck driver's like, You dumb broad. Uh, and John Hausman says, Now, Stephanie, extend your arm, extend your middle finger. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Never, like, always in the same, like, lilting sort of semi-English tone. It's amazing. It's so good. I also want to point out, I told Tyler when we were watching this scene, I'm like, Tyler, are you ready? This is the line. Here it is. This is where it's from. And after that moment, Frank Drebin goes, go for it, Stephanie. And then Stephanie, of course, is like a, a demon on wheels yeah. suddenly just chasing after this, this ne'er-do-well in another car. And Tyler says, what line? 
I said, D- go for it, Stephanie. I'm always saying that to you. And he's like, when? When You've have you never ever said, said that this in your entire life? And I'm like, well, you know, when we're like at intersections and like you're waiting for the cars to come by so you can like merge in. And then, you know, when there's finally a gap after we waited for a while, I'm like, go for it, Stephanie. And he's like, I've never heard you say that before in my life. And I'm like, well, I say it often. And this is where it's from. We watched the rest of the movie in silence. This movie reminded me of the phenomenon of like the pink candied pistachios, which I've completely oh, forgotten yeah. about. Tyler was like, what are they eating? And I was like, they're eating pistachios because they used to dust them red. Like, Why? Still it changed nothing on. about the color. It's just a pistachio covered in red dye and it would get all over your fingers, much like you see in the movie, it would get all over your lips. Yeah. If you were anything like the Xanthopoloi, we eat nuts like we're going to hibernate. We're just... <laughs> and so you just end up covered in this stuff. And it's like... And when I saw finally a regular pistachio, I'm like, what the fuck is this? And my dad was like, it's a pistachio. I'm like, why does it look like this? And he's like, this is what they look like. And after that, I was infuriated that they tricked me into thinking that they were red. Isn't why? it? Do they put the candy, the sugar coating like on the outside of the shell, right? So you have to like de-shell it? I don't think that it's candied. I think they just put a red dye on it. Oh, I don't know if I've ever it had It doesn't them. even, unless there's like a little bit of the, the actual nut exposed, the nut is still green. Why? Absurd. Anyway. Hold on. I want to be sure that I don't remember. I remember them tasting exactly the same. The first thing that comes up when you Google red pistachios is why. <laughs> <laughs> and? Foreign pistachio producers dyed the pistachios with a bright red color in an effort to hide the stains and make the nuts more appealing to consumers. Hold on. Due to antiquated harvesting methods, nutshells were often left with ugly stains and splotches. That's weird. And then it says, when did red pistachios go away? And the answer is the 1980s. Just I love it when there's a curt response to a genuine question. The 1980s. Next question. Next question. Yeah. Probably the most upsetting scene. I'm just going to get to it because it's next in my notes. Frank ends up out on a ledge oh, and then yeah. ends up like crawling After his he way. he burns down Rick- Ricardo Montalban's yeah. apartment. Yeah. And he ends up in this woman's apartment and is like not trying to do anything, but he's grabbing onto these statues. He ends up with the statue's penis in his hand and he brings it in. And then he's like ends up like on top of her. And it's all like obviously he's not trying to do anything, but it's also pretty upsetting. It's kind of gross. I mean, there's all these statues on the top of this building, alternating Art Deco like statues of men and women, all naked. And so while he's going from, he's clinging to the side of the wall yeah. and he has to like go from figure to figure. And, you know, he's using the women, the men's penises and the women's breasts to sort of keep himself up. Don't laugh. You said it was the most upsetting part. <laughs> Don't you laugh. And eventually uh, he accidentally, this woman is drying her hair while sort of leaning out the window so that she's perfectly lined yeah. up with these other, I'm not blaming the victim. I'm just saying that it's very odd that she's leaning out of the, the window the way she is while doing her hair. She's in a bra and he grabs her breast thinking it's the next statue. Now, because this is in the Criterion Collection, there is an old-timey car horn noise when he does grab her breast. Sure. She screams and slams the window closed, as is her right, yes. Deej. And he then falls, grabbing a penis on his way down. And then she opens the window again, I guess to see if he's still there, and he's like yeah. pulling himself up by the penis. And as you would pull, your hands are above your head, pulling yourself up, so your head would sort of be the first thing to sort of come in contact with the yeah. penis. He's struggling a little bit. So he's sort of gasping and sort of making a, a moaning sound while this penis is sort of aligned into his gaping mouth. Once again, this is how to deliver this joke is <laughs> you describing it very academically. Then naturally, the concrete phallus breaks off in his hand. Mm-hmm. He falls into the window that the woman had just checked in and then probably, you know, exhausted from clinging to the side of a building, starts approaching her with the phallus still in his hand as she screams. And that's the end of the scene. You know what I like about that is that I did already very briefly describe all that, but you went into... <laughs> ludicrous detail (laughs) to say essentially the same thing i just you know i just didn't want the nuance yeah 
Yes. To be lost. One of the, th- the things this movie is famous for is nuance. Here's the problem with our culture today, Deej. Everything's got to be 240 characters, doesn't it? We got to be pithy and jokey. We got to get our point across. <laughs> never mind details. Never mind facts. We just got to get it out there. I'm not standing for it any Not on this I'm going to talk about the travails of Frank Drebin in a situation of his own making through skullduggerous police chicanery. Approaching a woman with a broken phallus in his hand. He was just trying to get help. That's our t-shirt right there. That whole (laughs) paragraph. (laughs) Another thing that I'm probably going to try to work into conversation is, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Don't fire the gun while you're talking. (laughs) There are a lot of- Trying to shoot him and saying like, eat it, copper, or whatever. There are a lot of great jokes at the expense of cop movies. That's one that got my goat this time. Is that a phrase you would use if you were laughing? No. Got my goat? It's not. Okay. (laughs) Tickled my bone. Yeah, sure. If we can add another segment in between this and the part where I was talking about the concrete phallus, that would be great. (laughs) Just add a little bit more time in there. Just really. Just a musical interlude. I did laugh a lot when. So the whole premise of this movie is that there is a little button that Ricardo Montalban has. And as far as I can tell, Anyone wearing a watch within the vicinity of that, even if it's across a baseball diamond, will want to assassinate, do his bidding, which yeah. apparently has been already programmed into the machine, which is to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. What I love is there's this whole scene where Reggie Jackson, outfielder? Uh, yeah, I think. Left fielder? So, yeah, at least in this. Oh, yeah, she screams out, Frank, it's the left fielder. So anyway, he is coming to assassinate Queen Elizabeth. The second. And Ricardo Montalban, eventually he gets foiled and accidentally crushed by a spectator. And My Ricardo Montalban just way. pulls out. <laughs> Ricardo Montalban just pulls out a machine gun that he's carrying on himself to take Priscilla Presley hostage, which is something that people do when they're in a situation like this. Yeah. But there's this part where he's going up the steps and he's just like sort of pushing Priscilla Presley through the crowd to get away, but it's obviously just a dummy for no reason. (laughs) It's obviously just a dummy dressed as Priscilla Presley that he's just sort of flinging from (laughs) side to side as he walks up. It's ludicrous. But man, did it make me laugh because I feel like I've seen that on a lot of shitty cop movies. Yeah, where they're they're not trying to make it obvious. (laughs) Yeah. I also liked, Frank thinks that Jane betrays him at some point, and he says, by the way, I faked every orgasm. (laughs) So stupid. stupid. Uh, My favorite bit, though- We also, oh, I was going to bring up another cop thing where when they are arriving to view where Norberg had fallen, we hear a cop on a bullhorn before we see him. He's saying, please disperse. There is nothing to see here. Please disperse. And we pass by the crowd of spectators. It's just a husband and wife, like a middle-aged husband and wife just standing- Three inches from the police officer speaking into a bullhorn, and they're not moving or flinching at all. They're not going to go anywhere, and he's not making any effort to make them leave, aside from screaming in their face into a bullhorn. It really makes me laugh. I was I'm going to be honest with you. missed a, one of my favorite quotes, which is at the beginning of the movie when Nordberg is, is spying on the, the shipment, and he goes, this completes our first shipment of heroin, 100% pure. <laughs> natural dialogue the queen (laughs) is in a box (laughs) at the baseball game and there's two great jokes with that i'm sure there's more but these are the two that i remember when they get there (laughs) just like this trashy looking couple is just like sitting in the seats (laughs) and they have to like shoo them away which is a very baseball game thing and then it literally has the seal of queen (laughs) elizabeth on the box and these two guys are just sitting there and then also she, somebody in the same aisle as her orders a hot dog and she has to pass it down. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's really funny because you can't imagine the queen doing that in real life, but that's what you do at a baseball game, you know? Yeah. I have a baseball question for you. Oh, please. So Frank Jarbin takes it upon himself to frisk every baseball player. And there's a scene where he goes up to the pitcher and he's like checking the pitcher And he keeps finding things on the pitcher. And I'm like, I think he finds a tub of Vaseline in his hat. Yes. He finds a piece of sandpaper in his glove. Yes. He finds a belt, like a belt sander, like a full like thing on him at some point. 
And then, you know, the pitcher has this sort of like a shamed face. Yes. Thinking, I'm assuming these are all like cheating methods. Yeah. So pitchers will famously use any thing they can to gain any sort of advantage and that includes manipulating the baseball so uh-huh. sanding it down or just what like what is that do basically it changes the way that they can have a grip on it and their grip is what determines like what kind of pitch it is so mm-hmm. yeah so basically they're trying to it's like how do you sand a ball down on the mound when thousands of people are watching you well he wouldn't have or is that something you would do backstage before you came well, out. You'd, you'd the, have to be kind of the... sneaky about it. They're always like, you know, doing this with the, you know, like, obviously yeah, he wouldn't okay. have the, the... Right. That, <laughs> that I, was a that joke. I, yeah. I clocked that one as, no, yeah. that wouldn't really happen. You got me again, Frank Drebin. And they've added more r- rules about that. Like, now they can randomly spot check pitchers and stuff because they'll have, like, foreign substance, like vat- Vaseline or tar, you know, different stuff that can basically help them do anything that will manipulate the baseball. Okay, I figured that's Sorry what the Sorry for joke the real was. answer and not a joke answer. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Perd Happily, it had the cadence of a joke. I just didn't yeah. really know the specifics of the yeah. joke. But I do like that then the guy thinks he's caught and Frank is looking for a gun. Yeah. So he just puts all he the things care. back and he's like, here you go. Yeah. I also want to give credit where credit is due, yeah. as I always do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm keeping it 100 here. I, yeah, always. I do appreciate that this movie... The underlying element of that whole last scene is how boring baseball games are. (laughs) Is it? (laughs) It just feels like there's so much downtime where (laughs) nothing is happening. Just a snooze. We get the bad guy from Pee Wee Herman, a very brief cameo. He yells, it's Enrico Palazzo. Oh, yeah. That's Mark Holton, I think his name is. He also played John Wayne Gacy and I believe a directed Mm. DVD movie in the 2000s. I also want to point out, yeah. not to get too all the way past the movie, but this movie does something that I surprised ha- I'm surprised has not been picked up by more straight-laced movies, which is rather than just saying man in red car or something like that, it literally lists people who have just one line in the movie, it lists their line yeah. and their name. So you know exactly who it's talking about. And for him, it says it's Enrico Palazzo. Yeah. And then there's another one that's like, you killed him. I appreciate that. I think that's actually very helpful. The credits were pretty fun. Rather than just woman in coffee shop. There are a few funny bits in the credits besides that, too. It's like men and women deleted from the firework scene, <laughs> which is probably <laughs> true and also probably nice for them. Yeah. And then also like in case of tornado, Southwest Corner Basement. <laughs> <laughs> I do love a funny credit, too. That was, I remember Tiny Toons used to have one funny credit in every episode. Yes. And their credits went real quick. Yeah. So you had to be locked in. And you better believe this son of a bitch was two feet from the screen ready to go. Two feet. That's not a good... Two inches that's not, from the screen. That's not that close. Yeah. For a kid. I mean, I'm doing my hands like this. Listeners can't see it. I'm miming being very close to the screen. Yeah. One foot, You're absolutely right. Two feet. Oh, my that's, God. That's so far that's away. That's actually a reasonable distance from a TV. I mean, this is how far away you should be, but I couldn't... I wouldn't be able to see any Tiny Toons credits. <laughs> Why do I... Do I just have a ruler right here? It's my desk. Okay. Prop comic. The only other thing I want to point out is that... I Love L.A. by Randy Newman is just na- – he just fucking naming streets in that song. Because of this movie, I genuinely love that song even though the- I have no affinity for L.A. Or even Randy Newman if I'm being honest. He seems like a nice guy though. Mm. But but the- I do like that song because it play- the it almost in its entirety plays throughout a montage of Frank Drebin uh, frisking all these players. <laughs> Oh, I do want to point out that Alton Bennis, the guy who played Alton Bennis in that one episode of Seinfeld, who was so violent, he plays one of the Los Angeles coaches. No, one of the umpires. umpires. Maybe an umpire. Maybe a coach. He gets into a fight with Frank Drebin until he draws his gun. And then he's like, okay, yeah, he's out. Whatever. I looked that guy up. Hold on. Let me get his name. I'd hate to not have his name. Top cast. I don't want that. I want full cast. You can just put more descriptors in there lawrence tierney Mm. he apparently was a notorious drunk that's why jerry and george not just the characters but jerry and jason alexander were terrified of him on the set of seinfeld and didn't want to work with him ever again and he never came back for another episode no isn't that fun no it's not Mm. i'm ready for the verdict are you yeah i mean the rest of these are just me quotes although one thing that never made me laugh as a kid but really made me laugh this time was there's a montage to herman (laughs) Herman's Hermits, something good. And there's a scene, of course, of Frank and Jane running on the beach hand in hand. 
And then at one point we cut back to that after a few other cute scenes and they're still running on the beach and another couple is coming the same way and it's all in slow motion and Jane and Frank won't unlock their hands and they try and like create an arch for the other couple to go through, hit the other couple in the face, Just full causing line. their legs to go out from under them and them to fall on their backs. And man, again, I'm sure it's just a dream to listen to me describe it, but it's really funny. I think the funny part was when a person got hit in the face and then fell down. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> That's the sweet spot comedy wise for me. I also enjoyed in that montage them laughing, leaving platoon. And it was like, <laughs> it's a good bit. So stupid. All right, let's go to the break. Uh, yeah. Damon, what's your verdict? This movie is great. Your inner child is not an idiot. I mean, like we said earlier, the copiness and the OJ-ness of it should work against it, but somehow actually sort of laps itself into just com- still working because the cops are fools, completely incompetent. They're portrayed as sometimes violent and reactionary. And OJ Simpson pretty much just gets his ass handed to him throughout the entire runtime. There's a lot of good bits. I mean, like we said It throws so much at you. If you're not into puns, if you're not into weird camera tricks, if you're not into weird owl cameos, there's something coming up that you're probably going to laugh at because it's so ridiculous. And there's some jokes that have not aged well, but surprisingly few, honestly. We didn't really address that, but if you're a little nervous to go in for just like a a wacky, zany comedy like this that was made 30 years ago, maybe not 30. Is it 30? Yeah, pretty good. Don't answer the question. (laughs) It's surprisingly it's surprisingly safe in that regard. I can't speak to two and a half, and I certainly can't speak to 33 and a third that definitely has an anti-trans joke in it. Yeah. But for this one, it is still really funny and, and a pretty great time. I highly recommend it. It was great revisiting this movie. Great to see my friend Frank again, too. Yeah, totally agree. Here in a child is not an idiot. There's a couple of insensitive things, some jokes that didn't age well. But generally speaking, like you said, I was surprised by how few or how mild those were for the most part. And yeah, because it's kind of got this, the cops are idiots, the sort of copness of it all actually works. The OJ Simpson of it all is like, he's barely in this movie. And when he is, he's getting the shit beat out of him, which kind of makes <laughs> it be like, yeah, all right. Okay. Good job, movie. Okay. It, there's nothing that's uh, upsetting. I'm going to deduct points for casting him. I'm going to add points for beating the shit out of him. And even if you were an OJ Stan, it's comedy violence. He's not being like actually hurt. So- and also, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> wow, really taking a stance there. <laughs> I would like to nominate the actress who played Stephanie for the single single scene <laughs> Sally Field Award, please. I don't have an MVP because I feel like it's pretty across the board good. I mean, I feel like I have, I mean, everyone is great in this, but I'd have to just give it to Leslie Nielsen, which is not really in the spirit of the Catherine O'Hara Memorial MVP yeah. Award. Yeah. But he is like, he he pretty much carries this movie and he's great in it. He does a really good job. And I kind of forgot how sort of detestable Frank is. And yet you still, <laughs> because you love Leslie Nielsen so much, you still go like, yeah, this is great. What do you think, everybody? If you're in Charles and Idiot at gmail.com, you can email us, you can text us or leave us a voicemail, 615-576-0525. We'll play your message or read it on the show. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash you're in Charles and Idiot. Wait, I have a, actually a fun fact that I just remembered about this movie. So there's a brief scene where we see Nordberg's wife, and she is played... Oh, shit, I just closed it. But the point is, she later reappears in American Crime Story playing a juror on the Simpson jury, the O.J. Simpson jury. So she has played an O.J. Simpson juror and an O.J. Simpson spouse within her career. Isn't that wow. interesting? That is interesting. Yeah. If you want to support the show, <laughs> you can go to patreon.com slash you're a child's an idiot. We got all kinds of fun rewards and tears, and you get your name read in the credits like this. Thank you to Just Cuz. Lindsay Halleck. Scalphosaurus. Beth Sermont. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Caroline Amberson. Demon's Australian accent. Terrible. David Mort. Dr. Uh, Malgum's uh, heaving bosom. 
dramatically plays hot dog. That was supposed to be like a cop like ah, narration. Okay. You know what I mean? Her legs went all the way up. They were like their own hot dogs. <laughs> and their tuggle. Well done. His honor the mayor. Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon. I'm getting all James- the fun names today. <laughs> you are. I'm getting- <laughs> James Taylor. Folk artist James Taylor. Jeremy T. Powell and Jonathan Day. Josh Frigo. Karen Curd. Larissa Maestro. Lindsay Now. Particle Man. Shit on the cartouche. I got one. There you go. T. Smith. The elusive Van Gromkin. The Hands of Fate. The McWheely House of Cats. The Supreme Ruler of this podcast. The Zesty. Oh, you got to read that one. Do I? Yes. Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. Travis Vance, thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your child is an idiot. And I'm going to go ahead and make, Damon's going to sing the Naked Gun theme song <laughs> while I pretend to be a siren traveling through places the sirens shouldn't be going with a like a police car thing. <laughs> I'm in like a bread <laughs> shop. <laughs> What was that? I said, I'm in like a, a bakery. I said bread shop, uh, but just, that's not a thing. Are you some sort of bake smith? Is that correct? <laughs> I forgot about the B section. <laughs> Are like, is that like a thing that? junior high jazz bands do because if not it should be the naked gun theme it's song. a great theme song <laughs> yeah i mean i feel like the the moment has passed where you, you know what that viral one where they were like do they would march in like a in shapes they would do the moonwalk mm-hmm. michael jackson's moonwalk another perfectly aged person from pop culture but you know i don't know what they would do for a police squad if they wanted to. And I, I imagine it would just be like the five of us in the audience going, oh, ah, yeah, police uh, squad. Yeah. Yeah. Naked gun. Hey, you. In section G. This police is for squad. You. Yeah. I saw you. I saw Jeremy? You slightly knowing look. Do not throw caramels at Tevin, okay? Because it's a junior high. Anyway. Right. Of course. Sure. <laughs>